Um, we're going to be talking today more about how you can empower yourselves with this challenging condition and sort of, you know, what to kind of hold on to in terms of optimism and, and hope for the future. So, um, you know, that term future is actually very interesting because people usually think of it as an, in an optimistic light, but when you've got Parkinson's, kind of that, that future is scary and anxiety provoking and people are, you know, sort of thinking about the negative things that the future holds. So, um, you know, we, we will sort of touch a little bit on, you know, the importance of, of um, treatment and the challenges that people have, but I'm hoping that by the end of my talk you'll feel optimistic about the future. So we'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, the, the, the terms that I'm going to be using, um, and then we'll get into exercise. Um, you guys are going to be getting a whole lecture tomorrow on sleep, but I'll just touch on it briefly today. We'll talk about diet and the brain-gut connection. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about resilience and growth. I'm not a psychotherapist, but I'm sort of interested in this topic, so you'll get sort of a neurologist's view of things. Um, we'll talk about clinical trials that are enrolling and interesting, and future directions. So uh, most of you already know that Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative condition affecting the part of the brain that I like to call the autopilot. Um, and the autopilot is the part of the brain that uh, manages our automatic movements. So if I get up and walk across the room to get a glass of water, I'm not thinking about swinging my arms, keeping my shoulders back. I'm not thinking about, you know, where my legs are. I'm thinking about more important things. Um, so the part of our brain that manages that, I like to call it the autopilot. Um, and so because that's been affected by Parkinson's, the movements, those automatic movements get softer, slower, um, less smooth, um, s speech can become slurred, um, and the muscles can get stiff. Um, so the terms that we use for that, um, and there can also be tremor, which is a little bit of a separate issue. Um, the tremor is present at rest, meaning not with action or posture. Um, the slowing down of movements is called bradykinesia. Um, stiffening, as I said, rigidity. Balance problems are unfortunately very common. And then a whole host of what we call non-motor symptoms. Non-motor refers to all of the things about Parkinson's that are not specifically to, related to movement, mobility, um, and um, muscle um, activity. Um, just to sort of get into, like, what are we talking about with these terms? You guys may have heard of the term dopamine. Dopamine refers to the part of the, uh, the brain chemical that is reduced in that autopilot part of the brain. Um, a, brain um, a neurotransmitter is basically a, a brain chemical that's involved in communication between brain cells. Um, and it's not nearly as simple as just being a reduction in dopamine, um, but it's a main part of it. Lewy bodies, you've probably heard that term. Um, Lewy bodies refers to when we look at the brains of people with Parkinson's, um, we find clumps of an abnormally folded or a misfolded protein called alpha-synuclein. I bring this up because people always ask me, do I have Lewy bodies? Is it, you know, people are often confused about the difference between Parkinson's and Lewy bodies and dementia with Lewy bodies and Lewy body disease, and there's a little bit of a messiness with the nomenclature, but the idea is that everybody who has Parkinson's has Lewy bodies. Um, some people with Parkinson's, unfortunately, can develop dementia, which is cognitive decline. And then some people have a separate condition called dementia with Lewy bodies, which is kind of like a hybrid between having dementia and Parkinson's type symptoms. Um, Alpha-synuclein, on the other hand, is the misfolded protein that starts to clump together and causes the brain cells to get um, so essentially gummed up in the works. And then, interestingly enough, what naturally should happen is that we have a, a clearance mechanism. We actually do get these misfolded proteins all the time. And naturally, we clear them. Um, but the problem in Parkinson's is partly too much of the alpha-synuclein is misfolded and partly the clearance mechanism isn't working. So then instead of clearing it, um, the, those cells go on a kind of a programmed death and destruction. So they say, oh, too much, I'm going to shut myself down and, they, and the cells die. So um, this is relevant to what we're going to talk about in terms of the clinical trials going forward. 
Um, that's all sort of the nitty gritty just to kind of give us an idea, make sure we're all talking about the same thing. But let's take a step back again and talk more about the holistic approach that most of our movement disorders um, colleagues like to take with uh, Parkinson's patients. So back in the day, what we used to do as neurologists would be really just focusing on the motor symptoms. Again, talking about slowness, stiffness, rigidity, that kind of thing. We would talk about levodopa, which gets converted into dopamine. We would talk about the medications. Um, and then we would say, OK, you're looking good. I'll see you back in six months. Um, and the, the motor symptoms are really important. That's a big part of the quality of life of Parkinson's patients. But it's not the whole piece of the, um, it's not the whole puzzle. It's um, just one fourth of it, essentially. Um, and I'm not going to really get into nitty gritty about levodopa, different formulations of it. We're not going to be talking about surgery for um, Parkinson's disease. Um, but um, I want to sort of give you a, a broader picture of all of the things that impact quality of life in Parkinson's and the way that patients can feel empowered to um, do more on their own end as opposed to just, well, I'm going to go to my doctor and get a refill on my Cinemet. So, um, the four pieces of the puzzle of Parkinson's management, including movement, uh, present, uh, treatment of the motor symptoms, are also treatment of the non-motor symptoms. And that can include things like constipation, lightheadedness upon standing, urinary symptoms, cognitive issues, mood and anxiety type symptoms. And all of that really needs to be addressed by somebody who knows what they're talking about with, with Parkinson's patients. Um, there's also, you know, a very important piece of prevention. And this is, I think, our weakest piece in terms of really having something that's very clear cut for prevention. There's some things out there that are looking very promising that are available now, and then other things that are looking very promising for the future that we'll talk about. Um, but that's, that's obviously a huge part of, of the um, optimal treatment of Parkinson's is the preventative um, aspect of it. What we do know, non-medication, that's very important for prevention, is exercise. Um, and so that's sort of that fourth piece of that pie there. Um, exercise, physical activity, we'll get into the nitty gritty on that. You're going to be doing a lot of that today, which is fantastic. Um, but it's not just about physical exercise and activity. It's also about your emotional well-being, your social interactions you know, cognitive stimulation, all of that plays a very important role. So we'll talk about all of those. So um, <clears throat> I find that when it comes to Parkinson's, it's kind of like the brain telling us that, hey, we really need to heed that advice that we all know we're supposed to be doing. Um, it's kind of like whatever you could get away with when you were in your 30s and 40s, like, pulling an all-nighter, or um, you know, not eating right, or not exercising at all, and you're functioning fine the next day, you really can't get away with that when you've got Parkinson's. The brain needs what it needs, and it will make itself known. So it gets back to the basics. You know, exercise, diet, sleep, stress reduction, things that we already knew we were supposed to be doing, um, things that we've known since Hippocrates and Homer. So, um, you know, as Hippocrates said, if we could give every individual the right amount of nourishment and exercise, not too little and not too much, we would have found the safest way to health. That's true then, it's true now. Um, and then there is a time for many words, and there's also a time for sleep. So the importance of sleep, right? Um, so let's get into exercise. Uh, so this is actually really fantastic because we're learning so much more about what does exercise do for the brain as well as for the body. So it wasn't too long ago that Parkinson's patients used to be told, well, you know, just take it easy or don't fall, and that was kind of the most important thing. Or you might have a doctor who says exercise but then doesn't tell you exactly why and doesn't tell you how. Um, so it's important to kind of know what to do when you're told to exercise and know why it's important. So the why is, you know, in terms of what should you, what should you hope for, what are the potential benefits of exercise, um, improved gait and balance, less freezing, less risk of falls, improved flexibility, reduced rigidity, reduced risk of contractures, um, 
improved energy and endurance, improved quality of life, sense of well-being, um, improved memory and decision-making and concentration and attention, improved mood and reduced anxiety and depression, and improved quality of sleep. Now, how does this one you know, wonder drug do all of this? Well, part of it is that the exercise actually makes the brain's use of dopamine more efficient. So it um, essentially means that you're using your natural dopamine better, and you're kind of needing less medication. I mean, don't quote me on that. Don't, don't stop taking your meds, of course. The meds are important. But there's really a value um, add of the exercise itself. Um, we know that it's important for um, vascular flow, for so blood flow to the brain. Um, we know that it, um, specific kinds of exercise can make the neurons make new connections, which we call synapses, in the brain. So you're literally changing your brain when you exercise. It's what we call neuroplasticity. Plasticity means changeable. It doesn't specifically mean like a plastic material, but neuroplasticity refers to the fact that our behaviors, both good and bad, literally change the structure and function of our brain. So it's very empowering information right there. Um, and of course, what's good for your um, you know, heart is good for your brain, so exercise is good for cardiovascular health, and it supports the functioning of the immune system. So that's all the why and how, and now, you know, how do you do that? How do you make that into your, into your lifestyle? So small, uh, basic ideas, do what you enjoy, because if you don't like it, if it's a chore, you know, you're not really going to do it. You're not going to be putting your heart into it. Um, start small. You know, if you're somebody who's been fairly sedentary your whole life, you don't want to just jump up and climb Mount Everest the next, next day. Um, but one of the key points is changing it up. I have some patients who come to me and they say, oh yeah, I exercise, and they bring me this dusty, coffee-stained set of papers from their physical therapist that they saw two years ago, and they're doing the exact same thing twice a week. And I'm like, you know what, you gotta do something different, because when you're doing the exact same thing over and over again, it's boring for the muscles. The muscles aren't um, responding anymore. The, it's boring for your brain. You're not getting that same neuroplasticity changes. And it's boring psychologically. So you're kind of not really doing it as well as if you're learning something new. Um, that term mindfulness there, um, you know, this sort of sounds like a shishi fufu word, mindfulness. We kind of heard it bandied about too much. But it's very relevant to Parkinson's. Remember earlier I said that Parkinson's affects the autopilot. What that means is that the muscles and the nerves are fine. So if you think about it, especially at the beginning stages, you really can straighten up, you can swing your arms, you can take bigger steps, you can sneak up, et cetera, um, where that's only when you're paying attention to the movements. Once you stop paying attention, then, you know, unfortunately, slow and, and kind of stooped and all of that. Um, so while you're exercising, it's really important to be very aware of what your body's doing, and you get so much more out of that. Um, one thing that's very important, it's never too late to start. Um, do be safe. Do make sure that you're asking your doctors if you have any heart conditions or knee or back issues to make adaptations to your regimen. Um, don't be impatient to see results. It's not going to be like, you know, the day one that you're suddenly going to feel so much better. But do keep moving, whatever you do. Um, I get asked a lot, well, what kind of exercise should be doing? And so this is kind of like the same way we used to say this is your dose of your levodopa, let's say. This is how frequently you should be taking it. We can actually think about a dose and a you know, um, frequency of exercise. And this is going to have to be tailored to every patient. But I like to sort of prevent, present a general framework. And if, again, if you're sedentary, you shouldn't jump to this frequency. But something to maybe a goal to work up to, to think about. And again, everybody's different with what they like to do. Um, this is all on that background of do what you enjoy too. So first off, cardiovascular activity has been shown to reduce the progression of Parkinson's disease. In one study, it was high intensity, not the low intensity. So when people say, oh, I, I exercise, I go for a walk, I'm like, well, that's nice. Um, that's fantastic. It's better than nothing. Um, but, you know, if you didn't go for the walk and you were, let's say, on an exercise bike and you're really pushing your heart rate up, as long as your doctor clears you for that, then, uh, you know, you'd probably get more out of that. So, you know, 
I put treadmill with an asterisk there because I, the study was based off of a treadmill um, exercise. But I get a little bit nervous about people falling on that. It's a little bit hard on you know, the, the joint. So I prefer things that are low, in, uh, low impact or um, zero impact, but again, high intensity. So elliptical, swimming, stationary bike, water aerobics, um, about 30 to 40 minutes, three to four times a week if cleared by the cardiologist. Um, and then stretching can be done every day for 10 to 15 minutes. Um, don't neglect the fingers and hands. I find a lot of people forget to stretch there, and that's a place where people with Parkinson's can get kind of stuck and rigid. Um, do go slow. Hold the position for about 30 seconds. Remember to breathe. Um, do not overstrain with the stretches. Um, strength training is really important, and that refers to resistance. So basically, either weights or bands or machines. I like bands because they're portable, they're cheap, they're light, you don't have to invest a lot in you know, a whole big system. Um, and you can find DVDs on, um, you know, on Amazon or wherever to learn how to use the bands. You can increase the resistance by changing the band. You can exercise a whole, lots of different parts of the body with the bands. Um, but the idea with this, there was a really interesting study that I'll present in a moment. Um, and then balance training and walking, um, you know, yoga, tai chi, things that are working on balance are really important. Balance classes are great, um, you know, once or twice a week. Um, and then skill-based is really important. So what, what do we mean by skill-based? That means that it's not something that you learned how to do when you were one or eight or whatever. It's not that same kind of motor memory that you've been doing your whole life. It's something where you have to learn something new and, um, uh, change it up, like let's say with a choreography, whether that's dance or the boxing programs. Um, big and loud, you guys have probably heard of, um, of that. You've heard of power, maybe, um, Pilates. All of these things require more neurological input. You know, we've all had that experience of being on the exercise bike, and then before you know it, you're flipping through your magazine, and then you're kind of slowing down, and it's not, it's not really the same bang for your buck. So if you're going to put the time into exercise, you want to take that time to be paying attention to your body. Um, and that, the skill base is the one that really makes new connections in the brain. Um, so we will be, of course, dancing quite a bit this weekend. Um, both of these photos are of people with Parkinson's. I mean, not all three of them, but um, the bottom one is a TED Talk. You can find that online. Um, the boxing program, I will just say, because apparently this isn't um, obvious, nobody's getting injured, nobody's getting hit in the head with the boxing class. <laughs> it's all, I, I had somebody hesitate and they're like, did you know they don't, you, nobody gets hit? I'm like, yes, I knew that. So apparently I have to tell people now. Um, okay, so this is one of my favorite slides. It's a little busy, but bear with me. This is looking at progressive resistance exercise. So remember I was talking about bands or weights, et cetera. Progressive means for every week or so they were increasing the reps or the sets or the weights by about 10%. So some small incremental increase. And um, they did that over the course of six months, and then they followed these patients for two whole years. This was a randomized controlled trial. That means that they took people who'd had Parkinson's on average of seven years. So we're not talking about the very beginning stages. We're not talking about people who are naturally athletes or whatever. We're talking about the same group of people. They divided them in two. And one group, they had them do kind of a milder Parkinson's fitness program. That's the uh, dotted lines there. And then the other group, they had them do increasing reps or weights twice a week. Okay, so this isn't like an everyday commitment. And they found over the course of six months that both groups got better, but at the course of, at the point of two years, this one, I think this is my, yeah. So this top left one is the motor scores. That's basically down is better. So the dark line, you see that at the two year mark, they were not only better than the other the uh, control group, they were better than their own baselines at two years. I mean, that's huge. Also, um, they were better in their flexibility and strength. They, were, um, they needed less medication, at least at the 18-month mark. Didn't hold true at 24 months, but they needed less medication, which is amazing. And um, their quality of life was better in, at some time points. 
Um, and that is huge. The fact that they needed less medication tells us that exercise is like a drug. So it's very important. Getting into sleep, I won't spend too much time on this because you've got a whole lecture tomorrow, but you guys have probably experienced the idea of when you've slept well, you're performing well, and you haven't slept well, you have a bad day. So this is really important. Um, what I will say just briefly about it is do ask your doctor about it. Don't do it, overdo it with sleeping pills because um, they stop working and they're habit forming and they can increase the risk of dementia. Um, but sleep hygiene is really important. Sleep hygiene is another area where it sounds like the same boring advice that like, gosh, that just seems like, you know, too simple, too basic. But it actually works if you stick with it and it's really important for Parkinson's patients. So the idea with what we call sleep hygiene it means the behaviors related to sleep. So all of our, you know, smartphone and device usage, the TV, you know, the computer, all of that in the hours, the two hours before bedtime reduces our brain's natural hormone, which is called melatonin, and interferes with our brain's ability to put ourselves to sleep. So turning off the devices, the screens, two hours prior to bedtime is really important. Um, the other idea is like no caffeine after 2 p.m. The um, bed is for sleep. Don't spend a lot of time in bed you know, watching TV or reading or whatever because you're disconnecting the association of the brain of the bed with sleep. Um, and the more you toss and turn and have anxiety in bed, the more you're likely to have insomnia. So sleep hygiene and cognitive behavioral therapy go hand in hand with each other. Um, and there are a couple of books out there, um, I put a couple of them in there, um, that you know, um, can sort of give you guidance on that. Um, there are cognitive behavioral therapists that can help you with insomnia. And cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia is proven to work, no side effects, not habit forming. So, um, You'll hear more about that tomorrow, but I just wanted to emphasize the idea that there are things you can do, even if it sounds too simplistic, but they do actually work. So let's get into the gut. So um, people have been hearing a lot about this, very interested in this topic um, of how the gut and the brain are connected. So they are literally connected through what's called the vagus nerve. Vagus, not spelled like Las Vegas, but V-A-G-U-S which is Latin for the wanderer because that nerve is a very long and kind of convoluted nerve that gives us the information to kind of all of our visceral organs. Um, and it's connected right to the brain. So the idea of, you know, when we're stressed, our, our gut shuts down and all of that. Unfortunately, in Parkinson's patients, as, you know, the movement slow down, the gut slows down as well. So people have a very high... Um, risk of developing constipation, often years before the movement symptoms begin, um, but there are other symptoms as well. Um, so this is very relevant to how you're doing with your medications, because people, again, they think of constipation, no big deal, I have a bowel movement every four days, no problem. And it's really a problem um, on multiple levels. But even if you ignored the gut issues themselves, it's a problem with how your meds are being absorbed because you're relying on this slightly dysfunctional gut to absorb your medication. So when your gut has slowed down, the meds take longer to get absorbed. And there's also some evidence that bacteria in the gut can interfere with the, can actually met, what we call metabolize levodopa. That means that the, the bugs in your gut can actually make you have less levodopa in your system. Um, so there's, this is a very important connection here. Um, so when we talk about, um, let me go back here. Um, all right, let me move on. Um, so people have often asked me, or like people are wondering, does Parkinson's start in the gut? Um, and there's been some evidence that that alpha-synuclein I was talking about earlier that we see in the brains of people with Parkinson's, they can find it in the gut years before the motor symptoms of Parkinson's. Um, and um, then when we talk about bacteria, what that refers to is what we call the microbiome. So I don't know if you knew this, but you are a lot more foreign than native. What that means is that if you look at the number of cells in your body, 
the majority of them are non-human cells. They're bacteria, viruses, et cetera. So we're kind of just like walking around vessels of gut, uh, gut bugs and other bugs. Um, but mo a, a lot of the times, those um, bacteria are being used in a positive way. They metabolize our food, et cetera. But what can happen in Parkinson's patients is um, what's called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, where we have a, a shift from the diversity of the bacteria that we need to have, meaning um, there should be a large variety with small amount, not small, but like sort of even amounts of each type of bug. And what happens, especially with the Western diet and antibiotics, et cetera, is that we have fewer variety, but more of the bad gut of bacteria. And those, um, you know, that bacterial overgrowth can be associated with leaky gut. It can be associated with system, systemic inflammation. It can travel up the vagus nerve and cause neurological inflammation. It can be, it's thought to be associated with the formation of alpha-synuclein. Um, so there's a lot of interesting things that are happening with our, um, uh, with our microbiome. So um, getting into constipation for a moment, um, the um, constipation and delayed stomach emptying can essentially are referring to the whole gut system slowing down. As I mentioned, it can interfere with the absorption of levodopa, so it's important to treat. Um, it's important to exercise, have lots of water, green leafy vegetables, um, avoiding processed foods and excess sugar. Um, but um, you know, a lot of people will need over-the-counter meds for constipation. And it's important not to let yourself go three, four days without a bowel movement, but rather to be proactive and try to have a bowel movement every day, every other day, even if it means you're taking something every day or every other day, like um, Miralax or Colace or what have you. There are prescription strength motility agents that, if need be, a gastroenterologist could prescribe. Um, and there's treatment for delayed gastric emptying, which is when the stomach's not emptying quickly enough, and that can cause bloating and um, a feeling of being full early. And there's also treatment for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. All of those are, are best um, discussed with a gastroenterologist who's familiar with Parkinson's symptoms. Um, but all of that's important for you know, your general functioning, reducing inflammation, and the absorption of your levodopa. So is there a diet for the prevention of Parkinson's? Well, we don't know. There's no evidence. Um, but what I will say is that there is evidence in Alzheimer's disease for the Mediterranean diet preventing Alzheimer's for people who have mild cognitive impairment. And as you well know, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's are not the same condition, but the fact that they're both related to misfolded proteins and they're both neurodegenerative suggests that there's some overlap in terms of how the diet might be playing a role. So I, if people ask me, I'll say, think about the MIND diet, which is the Mediterranean intervention for neurodegeneration. But you know, you know, full uh, sort of grain of salt there. It's not proven or anything like that in Parkinson's. So the MIND diet is, I think, a fairly easy diet to keep because it's not overly restrictive. Um, it still allows for the occasional, you know, birthday cake on your birthday. Um, but the idea is lots of green leafy vegetables, lots of veggies, nuts most days, berries at least twice a week, beans every other day, whole grains, fish at least once a week, um, poultry at least twice a week, olive oil, and then the actual mind diet calls for a glass of red wine, but I find that's a problem with balance with my Parkinson's patients, so I'm not keen on that. Um, the, the groups to avoid are red meats, cheese, um, butter and margarine, um, pastries and sweets, and fried food and processed foods. Um, and I'm not sure why cheese has been vilified, you know, because Mediterranean people eat cheese all the time, but with, with diets like this, the way food science works is that they kind of have to look at the whole diet and they, they're not, it's not quite as um, specific to any one element of it. What they did find in the Alzheimer's group was that even people who weren't perfect with this diet, they still had 
a reduced risk. So very powerful. I also suggest avoiding high mercury, high mercury fish because that can impact brain function and nerve function. So people ask me about probiotics and prebiotics. Well, if the problem is you know, the bacterial, the mi microbiome, what if I took um, prebiotics or probiotics? No real evidence for that yet. It might be something that plays a role kind of two decades before you get Parkinson's. So I'm not sure if once you have Parkinson's it does anything. But there are studies that are being done on this. Okay, so let's get into resilience for you know, people who are sort of newly diagnosed or you know, really at any stage of Parkinson's. Um, specific to the newly diagnosed, I find that a lot of issues in include sort of that fear of the future. Again, we talked about the ambivalence of that word future. Um, people might be functioning okay, but they're so terrified about what's coming that it actually paralyzes them. Um, you know, living in an uncertain, terrifying future um, just kind of sort of robs you of your present. And also, as I mentioned before, what we, we never used to have this kind of emphasis on exercise and lifestyle. And we, you know, we have so many more meds now than we did before. We have a lot more treatments. You know, it's very, it's very important for people when they're in a group and they're looking at somebody who's had Parkinson's for 20 years or what have you, not to extrapolate onto themselves because it's a very good chance that further things are gonna come down the line and they're not necessarily going to have those issues or they might be delayed by many years. So that's an important thing to remember um, when you're looking at other people and how they're doing. Or, you know, a lot of people will tell me, oh, you know, my father-in-law had Parkinson's and da-da-da. So I'm like, you know, don't, don't automatically assume that that's what's going to happen to you. Um, an identity crisis, existential crisis, a very common, very challenging, that sort of idea of, like, the role that somebody played, the, you know, the, who they were in the family being kind of shifted. That, that can be a very big challenge for Parkinson's patients. And then there's a, uh, some people sort of express a feeling of, of defeat um, that, you know, no matter what they do, they feel like they're going to, they're going to sort of lose out. And, and that's a very challenging symptom to, or, or a feeling. Um, and sort of it's easy for me to kind of um, try to encourage you, and it's harder to, to live with it on a day-by-day -day basis. But there is a lot of reason for hope, as I mentioned. Um, and there's actually evidence that optimism and re um, resilience improves outcomes. Um, and um, the thing about hope, though, is it's important to distinguish between realistic and unrealistic hopes. Um, so what I mean by that is, you know, it's not realistic to sort of wish away the Parkinson's. I find that, you know, it's, this sort of came as a surprise to me, like how many people are living in denial. Like, you know, I had a patient who had Parkinson's for eight years, and it's like, well, I don't really think I have Parkinson's. I don't really think I need meds for this. I'm like, really? Like, it took you eight years and you still don't believe this? I mean, it's very powerful denial. So that kind of unrealistic hope, um, it doesn't serve you well. It kind of lends you down the wrong road. Whereas realistic hopes of, okay, I do have Parkinson's. I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to try to live my best day every day as best as I can. That's, that's a realistic goal. Or like, you know, things like I'm going to, you know, go see my grandkids or I'm going to travel or whatever. Those are realistic goals for many patients. I'm going to skip to the slides. So general tips for family members. Um, keep the positive moments in, in mind. You know, have a daily journal of gratitude or a daily journal of accomplishments as opposed to that daily journal of symptoms that kind of brings us down. Um, you know, Thinking positively, and again, this sounds very hokey. I know I can I can hear your skepticism already, um, but it does. It, there's evidence that it works, and there's you know there's uh, neurobiology reasons why this works. So, trust me, I'm a neurologist. <laughs> you can it really does work to do those kinds of things. Be grateful for large and small acts of kindness. Um, you know, that idea of putting your oxygen mask on before helping others. When you're the caregiver, when you're the family member, um, you know, making sure that you're taking care of yourself. Um, do come to the doctor visits. Familiarize yourself with what meds your family member is taking. Um, you know, do the research. Don't be afraid to ask questions. And a lot of doctors use a lot of jargon. They might use terms that you're not familiar with. You want to make sure to ask, question them on that. Um, but do try your best to accept the new normal. Um, pray for the best, for, plan for the worst, and do what you guys are already doing here, getting involved in the community. That's amazing. Um, I, I want to sort of credit this to a blog that was written by a person who's, whose husband has 
dementia with Lewy bodies. And then general tips for people with Parkinson's disease. Again, same ideas, but one of the other keys is keeping moving and finding a reason to get out of the house or out of bed in the morning. So a lot of people are retired, and they ask them, well, what do you do all day? And they're like, well, you know, I watch TV, I'm on my computer, da da da. I'm like, you know, you need something that motivates you. You need something that you know brings you joy, brings you fulfillment. Um, whether it's a project or a community or you know volunteer services, um, when you don't have something that's getting you out of the house, you know, frequently enough, then you sort of lose that will for living, and then you know you can become this bump on a log kind of situation. And Isolation is incredibly common in Parkinson's patients, and I'm probably preaching to the choir because you guys are all here, but you know, even so, I, I, I'm sure if you think about it, you'll see people who are you know, really not reaching out, they're not talking to other people, they've stopped talking to their friends, they've stopped going out, and it's a very big problem with Parkinson's. So do make sure to constantly be looking for, for and seeking out social interactions. So an example of that is people will tell me, well, I'm gonna keep my mind active by you know, using my iPad to do you know, brain games, or I'm gonna be doing my crossword puzzles, that's gonna keep my mind active. It's like, but that's just a you against the paper thing or against the screen. That's not a human social interaction. So I'd rather see people like take a class at a community college or something, get out and try to be with other people. Um, you know, even if you're feeling like you're not, you know, who you used to be. I would suggest subscribing to blogs. There's a lot of great information that is written to the degree, to, you know, to a level that is intended for um, lay people um, that gives information about all the research that's happening. It's very empowering. Um, so um, APDA has one called A Closer Look. Um, there's Fox Feed blog, which is from the Michael J. Fox Foundation, Parkinson's News Today. Um, and do recognize that the journey is a roller coaster. I find a lot of people, once they've had a few bad days, they think, oh gosh, this is it. Let me call the nursing home. My life is over. Um, and then they give it a few more days, and lo and behold, they're feeling better, they're sleeping better, whatever it was. You know, they took their meds on time. They start to feel like, oh, hey, actually, I'm, I'm back to my usual self. And I find that um, you know, it's important not to catastrophize because it's, very, it's a very challenging condition in terms of those ups and downs. But if you're in a down moment, do try your best to think about what you're doing. Work towards the, the better and you will find that you will improve. Um, so let's get into clinical trials and preventative options. Um, so first of all, clinicaltrials.gov, G-O-V, not .com, not .org, .gov. Um, gives you the up-to-date information. It, you can filter it by Parkinson's location, what's actively in, in recruiting, um, you know, age range, et cetera, and that will give you the most up-to-date information. Um, FoxTrialFinder.org is another way to connect to clinical trials. Um, obviously, it's a very personal decision if you want to get involved with experimental medicines or not, but the only way the only way we will have any better treatment, whether it's prevention or cure or just better symptomatic treatment, is with people just like you participating in clinical research. So keep that in mind. When people are saying, oh, what's coming, what's coming? Well, like, if you in, uh, participate, there's more chance of things happening. So um, there's a clinical trial on the diabetes medicine liraglutide, um, which is a GLP-1 agonist that um, had some you know, positive um, hope for preventing progression of Parkinson's. This one's a 14-month trial. It's at Cedars. Um, it's a once-a-day injection of the drug versus placebo. It's a 50-50 chance of get, getting the drug. You have to have had Parkinson's for at least two years and be responsive to levodopa without diabetes. Um, the Pasadena trial um, is uh, really looking at, this is fantastic, because we're actually looking at clearing the alpha-synuclein. We're looking at treatment that's going to clear that misfolded protein and um, try to prevent the progression of Parkinson's. This trial is only looking for people with early Parkinson's, not on levodopa. First two years of diagnosis. It's a once a month infusion. In the first year, there is a two, to three, two out of three chance of getting the medication. Um, in the second year, all participants get the medication. 
and it's enrolling at La Jolla, Sunnyvale, UCSF, and Fullerton. I think they're closed at USC already. Um, they're similarly, um, Biogen has a, a monthly IV infusion that they're studying. Also, early Parkinson's, not on any meds. Um, that's also a two-year study. Also, a 75% chance of getting the study drug in the first year, and all participants get the study drug in the second year. Um, that's enrolling at Cedars and UCSF. Um, there is um, a cancer drug that you guys have probably heard about that um, it increases the clearance of alpha synuclein. That's an, just a smaller trial is enrolling, which is a safety and tolerability trial. Enrolling in Long Beach, um, they're looking for Parkinson's patients younger than 65 without cognitive decline. It's only a four-week study. Um, it's a once-a-day oral medication. Um, there will be a trial enrolling for another um, type of medication called a LARC2 inhibitor looking to clear alpha-synuclein again. Um, this one is in Long Beach. They're looking for um, Parkinson's patients at stages one through three, so it's sort of like early to moderate. Um, it's a six-week trial. And then also, I talked earlier about the microbiome. So there will be a study at UCSF, um, a two-week trial. Um, so they're looking at people who are responsive to, uh, to levodopa with off time, meaning the meds are not lasting the whole day. And um, they're going to be actually looking at the microbiome and correlating it to clinical symptoms. And then they're going to be doing a randomized controlled trial of an antibiotic to reset the bacterial profile. Um, so that'll be very interesting. Um, there are two cognitive um, clinical trials I wanted to highlight. One of them is looking at a medication um, for Parkinson's disease-related dementia. That one is at USC, UC Irvine, right here in Irvine, and Long Beach. Um, and then there is a non-medication intervention, which is called COGSMART, which is a kind of like a compensatory training mechanism. Um, it's in San Diego at the VA, one and a half hours a week for 10 weeks with a 12-month follow-up. They're looking at Parkinson's patients with cognitive decline. So where are we going in the future? So this is my way off the beaten track, like way futuristic, but you know, I really do think it's going to happen, um, hopefully soon. Um, but um, what I'm envisioning is, I think we think, need to think of neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's as how do we prevent them from happening in the first place? You know, the same way that we try to prevent heart disease and stroke by looking at your blood pressure and your heart rate, and you go into your doctors and you get your cancer screening, all of that, I think that we're going to shift towards um, you know, a more population-based um, uh, uh, prevention. So first off, we need to identify who's at risk, because obviously Parkinson's disease, it's a million people in America, so it's not, you know, um, ev not everybody's at risk for it. Um, but those with a family history, those who have REM sleep behavior disorder, which is that dream enactment behavior that often um, occurs years or even decades before Parkinson's begins, um, and then maybe even population-based screening. Um, then we'll need to risk stratify. So we'll have sort of some population we're interested in, and then we'll say, okay, what can we do that's very easy and non-invasive, just like checking your blood pressure, just like checking your cholesterol, that is gonna give us a sense of what your risks are. So I think that might include smell testing, because um, a loss of smell is uh, often you know, occurring 10 or 20 years before the onset of Parkinson's. Um, there might be some kind of really simple motor screen in the, in the doctor's office. And then there might be, at some point, a retinal screen, like some way of looking for alpha silicon either in the eye or in salivary glands, things that are going to be non-invasive. Um, and then um, there will need to be some kind of confirmation of the risk, some sort of biomarker that might be a little bit more invasive, like, say, the DAT scan, which is currently available, but we're just using it for people who already have motor symptoms. Um, and then we're going to talk about preventative management. So some of this might be the things that we're talking about already in clinical trials, like alpha-synuclein clearance. Some of it might be antioxidants. You guys may have read about the antioxidants years ago, like CoQ10 or other vitamins, and they failed. Well, maybe they failed because we need to be thinking about it as a prevention, not as you know somebody already has Parkinson's. 
Um, you know, maybe, maybe there's toxins involved. We know that pesticides are associated with the development of Parkinson's, so maybe there are some toxins that need to be cleared. Maybe it's going to involve microbiome management, avoidance of overuse of antibiotics, things like that. And then maybe, 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 maybe stem cells that might play a role. But all of that is going to be on the context of exercise, diet, social interaction, sleep, all the things we already knew. So this is my sort of vision for the future. Um, but I think it's really going to be, I'm, I'm envisioning a day where people are going to come, my, my like younger med students are going to come to me and they're going to say, tell me what it was like, Dr. Petrosian, when you know, we didn't have these treatments. I can't believe that. You know, and I, that's what I'm hoping for. Um, and then we're going to set a video up right now um, to preface this. You guys have probably heard that Ellen Alda um, recently came out with having Parkinson's disease. So I came across his uh, um, interview on um, CBS This Morning, and I just thought it was so inspiring um, because you know he you know he's dealing with symptoms, but he sort of has a. Uh, um, you can go ahead and play. This is his sort of take on how he's dealt with it. What's interesting is this is, diff this is a disease that's different for almost everybody who has it. Mm -hmm. There are some common symptoms, but mo mostly everybody's different, and each day is different from the next. One day you wake up, you think, oh, it's over, it's gone. The next day it's back a little worse. Right. You, you don't know what it's going to be, but the main thing is there's stuff you can do. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, I've been, you know how I look at it? It's like a puzzle to be solved. Mm -hmm. What do I have to adapt to to carry on a normal life? You, and and and, and I'm, no, I'm, I'm enjoy, I enjoy it. solving puzzles. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's really fun. Well, you have a remarkably optimistic, can-do attitude about a disease that a lot of people are scared about, but also angry when they have these yeah, diagnoses. That's, but that's you, true. your staff says you have displayed no signs of I'm anger. I'm glad to hear from my staff. <laughs> <laughs> say that. That's, no, that's encouraging. That's good. I don't it's, know how you look from the outside. You know? <laughs> I mean, really. But I'm not angry. I'm, how I'm are you just, not angry? Because. It's a challenge, you know. You you got to cross the street. There are cars coming. How do you get across the street? You mm -hmm. don't just sit on the pavement and say, "Well, I guess I'll never cross the street again." You know, I I love that analogy of needing to cross the street, and how do you do it? So that's what you guys are here today, this weekend, to do is find small things that are going to make big differences when done consistently and combined to help you cross that street.